David said to me, whatever it takes, I am going to get out of here. He never gave her, in my opinion, enough credit for what she did for him. Whatever David wanted, DeFries said yes to. When David put his arm round Ronna on television, never before seen, you know, all these people that were ready to come out of the closet, open those doors and out they came. He will be remembered, you know, hundreds of years from now, I'm sure. <laughs> I want to take you back, obviously, you know, that everyone does this and takes people back to their childhood. But you had a very unusual upbringing to the extent that your parents were incredibly liberal for that uh, period. I didn't think it was unusual, by the way. I mean, I just because when you're a child, you don't think of uh, checking it with anyone else. Does this mean, Steve, that you've read my memoirs? I've read your memoirs. I've been I've been on YouTube all morning. I've, I've loved it. And yesterday, to be honest, and I've just had the most fantastic time. Actually, and I have to say, yeah, I mean, I loved it. And possibly because I'm a gay man, I read it and I just love some of the stories in it you know, that, that are just <laughs> incredible. But you've had such an unusual life and also, you've had such a full life that by the time you were out of your teenage years, I feel, and I'm in my 60s, I haven't lived enough. Yeah, I did have liberal parents, but as I said, I didn't know it was odd. And I knew from an early age that the things that kind of interested me was music, chocolate and dogs and cats and, you know, animals are really simple. I was not at all academic at school. I coasted by but everyone who's read the memoirs, I'm always astounded that they say, gosh, the, the book's amazing. And sadly, it came out when COVID was around, which was a blasted nuisance. So bookstores were closed. So it was only sold online. And I do very little online. I'm not really interested in the techno world at all. I, I like speaking to humans. So I won't go into shops that won't take proper money they only want plastic money and i won't go into shops where you have to self check out your food yourself bollocks to that can i swear by the way you i just swear as much as you like. <laughs> <laughs> where are you by the way steve i'm in germany i'm in germany oh. and coming to that your mother well where did she meet your father how did that come in about in england he'd obviously you know it's very hazy about what he did during the war um he arrived with an older brother who had a thick German accent, whereas my father had no accent at all. And when they wanted to, when one of my cousins tried to check out on what my father had done during the war, the war office here said, we're not releasing his info for another hundred years after his death. So we kind of suspect that he might have been up to God knows what, but he spoke perfect German, he spoke perfect English and perfect Italian and pretty good French. So. You know, I don't really know what he did in the war, but they met over here and three weeks later they got married, much to my mother's father's horror because he'd spent World War I fighting Germans and then suddenly she brings back somebody who was uh, half Austrian and a quarter German and there was a quarter English. But basically, um, you know, he but he moved in quite high circles, you know. I remember him saying to me that he'd had breakfast with Hitler which, you know, didn't mean a thing to me when I was a child. I remember opening my front, the front door of the house to Sir Oswald Mosley. Didn't know what a fascist thing was either. But he also um, was moved in very high circles in Britain, you know, with the law, with the Astor family down at Cliveden. And apparently he had been Winston Churchill's doctor for a while. Who knows? I never thought to ask him, you know, when... When we were young, my sister and I, we never, it never entered our heads. Whereas my, and we had very few relations in this country. Whereas my mother's side was awash with relatives. And so I saw most of them. I mean, it's interesting that he said, I mean, interesting, it's fascinating that he said he had breakfast with Hitler. Because when Orson Welles talked about meeting Hitler, he basically said it was a... a, a a non-entity meeting it, it was boring it, you know I don't remember that but I my father for some reason was very friendly with the Mitford family so even now when I open up various books on let's say Unity Mitford or Nancy Mitford or something um and I've still got all the books that he kept um outfalls letters from 
you know, the author or, or Diana Mitford, the one who was married to Oswald Mosley. I get confused with all of the family, but so he was very friendly with them. I mean, in those were the days though that people wrote letters um, so that communications were saved. Nothing is saved now, nothing is safe and it's all on bloody line, which makes me furious. I like to write things down. And when concerts come in, they come in obviously via email, I get booked, but I, it gets put in a book with pen and paper, a, a diary, you know, where I write things down. <laughs> so what, sort of, what sort of music were you brought up around? Well, my father, having Austrian roots, was very fond of very fond of Richard Tauber, if that means anything to you. You know, the, the, he used to sing operettas and not quite schlager music. I, I assume, Steve, you speak German as, as well as I do, too. How yeah, long, no, I speak German, yeah. Yeah, how long have you lived there? Oh, well, this interview is about you. <laughs> All right, okay. 28, 29 years. But let's okay. get back to you, because I know that in your mother's car, she used to play a particular track which um, I, I, I brought tears to my eyes when I read it. What, the Cocaine Bill and Morphine Sue. Yeah, tell me about that. Well, well, she didn't play a track. She sang it. We didn't. Those days, cars didn't have tracks. Oh, cool. We're talking about the 50s. <laughs> you hardly had a radio. No, she used to sing when she was driving us to school. or if I, She would sing hymns anyway, because that's all we kind of knew, or the odd thing that came from war years but this was one that came from the war years and it was cocaine bill and morphine sue walking down the avenue have a little on me have a little on me and we all used to go together because that's what you do when you're six years old and years later I did ask her where on earth did you sing this to your <laughs> you know your two daughters this song and she said well it was just a, a war song people sang it it was probably played on Itma, if that means it's that man again. All these old war things. I mean, I'm that little bit older than you, and I started very young in my life, but I've got a very good memory. And my mother was hugely influential on me, basically for her goodness, her kindness, her niceness. Um, I always knew I would never be a mother because I knew I could never find anyone. I would never be as good as my mother was. But she used to sing this this song, as we would go to school, either in a in a car, but often on a pony or on a bicycle with me on the back and my sister on another bicycle because my sister was three years older than me. So singing was a big thing. And my father, who was musical, but like me, never bothered to read a note. He would sit down and play Viennese waltzes. You know, he'd, he'd play Unter Lullaby. Habe ich ein Mädchen geküsst, which is a Richard Tauber song. You know, all these melodies come back to me. And then in 1980, I I actually took off for uh, Vienna and spent a lot of time there. And what, I'll, I'll come to that obviously a bit later, but to, yeah. to go back to your um, childhood, I know that, you're, okay, your father's background is a bit sort of, let's say the word suspect in a way. <laughs> you know, hazy, we don't know what hazy. It is. Hazy, okay, let's use but the word hazy. But interesting, he was yeah. definitely I mean, good looking. Yeah. And Absolutely. It, he was very much a hit with all the women. And I dare say he might have had a couple of saunters into the male departure as well, only because of a couple of rumours I heard. But basically he was a, a, wom a, a woman's man, you know. <laughs> You were brought up in this sort of liberal, uh, free thinking, you know, like do what you like atmosphere. What is there to rebel against when you're brought up in that atmosphere? Because I find it, it you know, interesting that you had, in a sense, a very rebellious life. Well, I didn't have anything to rebel against because I could tell my parents anything. They were really, my father was super intelligent, you know, and read so many millions of books. And, you know, he had a library which was marvellous, you know, and from a very early age, I was being given books by Jung, Gurdjieff, Nietzsche, Kierkegaard. I'm talking about 12 years old. Um, okay, I also, my favourite books at that time probably were Tintin, um, or as you call it in Germany, Tim und Struppi. But does that mean anything to you? Yeah, absolutely. Cartoon. <laughs> but, you know, I was well read, but my sister was the bright one. I was the one that was basically my mother thought I was going to be a concert pianist but that meant reading sheet music which I had no interest in um so I 
I didn't have anything to rebel against because I was able to tell them in everything. Well, I didn't tell them everything, but, you know, all that they needed to know at the time. And so from the age of 11 to 15, as I said in, in, in my book, I delivered newspapers uh, before going to school. And I was at an extremely good private school in Sloan Square called the Francis Holland School, which sort of had titled people's children and diplomats' daughters. It was all a girls' school. But they let me do these things because I think they probably realised if they told me not to, I would have done it anyway. So best let this twit get on with it and make her own mistakes, which was fine. You were also very forthright because at 11, you said to your mother, I'm going to be famous, I'm going to change my name. Yeah, well, I yes, I did. I mean, I don't know really where that came from, but I've always had strong family ties and as I've described in my book my real name is Richenda that's what's in my passport and because it comes from such an old illustrious family I didn't want it being besmirched by the great unwashed as I might have called them in those days by people who didn't know the backline story of where the where the name came from which is in itself is interesting and for people who are who've had British five pound notes in the last, well, let's say eight years ago, I think my great, great, great grandmother was taken off the five pound note and has been replaced by Winston Churchill. But it was a pretty illustrious family I came from. So I felt, I still feel quite, you know, strong ties for the family. And every year in July, all the Buxton's, Gurney's and Fry's from this age old family, we all go to Westminster Abbey where there's a huge marble statue of Sir Thomas Buxton and Thomas Fowle Buxton, and he, with William Wilberforce, basically abolished slavery. But Wilberforce probably got more credit for it, although he only lived for one year. My great 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 grandfather lived for another twenty five years and freed slaves in in many many countries. I've been to. I was singing in Guyana and saw to my amazement a statue and a whole township named after Buxton. There's an area in Sierra Leone. They have always come from a line of do-gooders. And maybe some of my do-gooding might have been seen as rather a curious way of doing good. Um, but in the 60s and 70s, one helped people in other ways. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Where did your interest in the drums come? Uh, well, I first heard a record. I don't know where I heard it. You know, when I was suppose about before the age of 10, when I was still living in this marvellous old Lutyen's house in Surrey, uh, we moved to London when I was 10. We used to listen to something called Uncle Max Radio, and it was a thing on BBC. Um, and I must have heard somewhere Let There Be Drums by Sandy Nelson, the drummer, who I seem to remember had a wooden leg. I didn't know that then. So I thought, this is an instrument I like. And also... In 1962 or three, there was a group called the Honeycombs. And have I the right to hold you? Anyway, the girl drummer was there, Honey Langtree. And there was another group called the Applejacks. And I can't remember the name of their hit, but there was a girl bass player. So that was two role models where I felt, yes, that's for me. And I really loved the drums and I had a marvellous drum teacher you probably noticed the story in my book how he used to stick porno pictures under my nose to make sure I didn't drop my paradiddles and flams and triplets didn't bother me at all I was 30 never thought anything odd about it the whole world these days is so blastedly oversensitive whereas I just thought well okay I'll get on with it and I'll do my drumming and he was a great drum teacher so I didn't care you bought your own drum kit I mean you were so determined from my gonna... paper round money. I made yeah. 12 and 6 a week in old money, and then it moved up to 17 and 6 a week. And it shows how dedicated I was because it was every day from 5 till 7 in the morning before school, um, which meant that, I, you know, I, I also mentioned in the book how I had to dodge the flashes. Men used to stand on the doorsteps flashing. Though I had two regulars that would stand cock in hand actually in their pajamas waiting for me to throw the newspapers at them as I bicycled past in my um rather dreary school uniform with a which but maybe that's what got them going but I was always big for my age as well so maybe they thought I was older so you you used to go because in I think it was in Golden Square that they had 
Foot's Music, and which I think was the drum shop where you would have. Yes, actually, I, well, I no, I bought my drums. It was a company called Ajax, but the shop was Drum City on Shaftesbury Avenue, and ah, that's good. where I saw a tiny. Well, I know Foots as well. Um, although, of course, that means something different in German, so I have to be careful there. But um, <laughs> um, I used to, I saw an advert saying a drum teacher, Mr. Frank King, and he was literally in Archer Street where the Windmill Theatre is, as in We Never Close. And so I used to go there once a week to see him, you know, going through the red light district. In those days, Soho was exciting. It was fun. It was it was great. You had your Tin Pan Alley. You had all these great music stores. Now, of course, it's been homogenized. There's Old Compton Street, known, of course, as Old Campton Street because it's quite gay. But that's probably the last of the gay. It's kind of gone gay. But all the fun places like Tin Pan Alley, they've all been knocked down for money. It's appalling what we do to our history just for money. What was it like as a teenager I mean, you know, you mentioned the flashes, you mentioned that side of it, you mentioned uh, Frank King, who would show you porno pictures to try and put you off. But yeah. what was the excitement and the difference of Soho? And how did a young teenage girl, as you were at the time, um, deal with that? And what did you take in from that that was of interest to you? Well, there was nothing to deal with. It, it was just life was out there. You know, the people weren't stabbing each other like they do these days the aggression was down okay the tubes didn't run all night which they do sort of now but i used to go from the age of 13 down to the marquee club just the joy of going in of course i did look older and they never questioned my age at the door but people didn't care how old you were nobody very few people walked around with passports I and mean, it wasn't that long after the war so even if we're talking sexual things, nobody cared if you were 14 or 15 or 16 is okay, but nobody cared because nobody asked. It was, you know, you just carried on with life. And of course, then I met Bowie, uh, who was still David Jones at the Marquee Club. And I think I must have been 14, probably just going on for 15, underage, let us say. But again, who gave a toss in those days? Nobody. I didn't and nor did he. And and you just, it was safe. You were safe on the roads. My parents were never worried about me because you weren't going to be sort of taken into an alleyway and alleyway and raped or anything. People were kinder in those days. There was less aggression. There was very little on the television. There was Muffin the Mule and Andy Pandy and something called Six Five Special at six five past six in the evening. And the television switched off at about nine o'clock. So people weren't being fed aggression anger, envy, entitlement, all the things that's on our screens now. So I was, I lived in an age of innocence and it was beautiful. And sitting in Tin Pan Alley, which is actually Denmark Street, we would all sit, all the musicians, and I was still very young, would be sitting in there with Bowie, then still Jones, and various other musicians. We all wanted songwriting publishing deal or if a record deal was almost beyond a, a dream, a songwriting deal was what Bowie and I had wanted. And you sat there and you waited till somebody from one of the publishing houses came in and said, oh, who, have you got a bass player? And a bass player would leap up and go out and leave behind his stone cold cup of tea because you'd order a cup of tea or a coffee, which was revolting, or a sort of baked beans on toast. And you'd make it last for hours waiting in this funny little cafe till somebody came and wanted somebody who had some potential to sing or, you know, to do some backing or whatever. I mean, weirdly, so, you also talk about the fact that you were a water skiing champion. Well, yes, look at my, well, you can't see. No, you can see. My shoulders, my shoulders. I always was big. And I think probably I was junior water ski champion from the age of 13 to 16. That's four years. By 16, I'd already made some singles and I could see that water skiing... <laughs> and music business don't go together. Music business meant late nights, boys and having fun. Water skiing meant training. I still, I held it together for about a year and a half. Then one had to go and water skiing cost money. Whereas theoretically singing, you make money. So it was understandable that I went, um, that I left it. But I was, 
I was always quite fit. So, you know, I all my life I've done dancing classes. And even now I swim every morning for half an hour. I do aqua size and have done for the last 40 years because I'm lucky enough to live around the corner from two minutes from a swimming pool. So I've got no excuse not to go. But if I want to be on stage and do a two, three hour show, I have to be super fit. I can't fuck around and, you know, say I've got to sit down. I've got to be as fit as my young band and some of the guys in my band are 22 years old. You said you saw Davy Jones, who later became Bowie, mm -hmm. of course, um, on stage the first time. And then he came up afterwards and met you. Can you tell me about that initial meeting and also what you thought of him when he was on stage and the surprise of him coming up to talk to you? Well, I, he was a support act, if I remember rightly, and I can't remember who he was supporting, but as, I'm assuming it must have been the Yardbirds because they were my fave band at that time. I went to every gig I could find of the Yardbirds. And in fact, the then manager of the Yardbirds, Georgia Gamelski, offered me my first ever recording and management co contract. And he came to talk to my father, but it, it was too young and so I didn't sign. I, I suppose I was 13 then. Um, so Bowie was just, I mean, I think I was just watching this thing, this act on stage, but I was, you know, I was more, had leanings for Eric Clapton, actually, or or later then that turned into Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck. But by this time already, Jimmy Page had played on my first album. But yeah, so at the end of the evening, I'm at the back of the, of the Marquee Club brushing my hair, my waist length. Uh, a hair with a few peroxide streaks in it because I didn't know how else to get these blonde streaks and Bowie came up and took the brush out of my hand and carried on brushing and whispered into my ear can I come home with you tonight so he must have thought I was over age well, it didn't really matter but I said yeah I I mean I as we walked home because it was about a 20 minute walk from Soho to South Kensington I remember thinking, well, oh, how am I going to introduce him in the morning? And of course, I did introduce him in the morning after we'd spent our first night in a single bed together. But next, my drum kit were there. My my drum kit was there and I had my guitars. I used to sort of, I already started to collect musical instruments. But when you start out as a guitar, you tend to just have a six string Spanish guitar because they cost a fiver and they're cheap. Um, but we, Bowie and I used to discuss music, you know, songwriting he listened to my songs I listened to his songs um, a lot of people have wanted to know some other details but frankly we were so young and I don't think it's really it, was it, it a, a mutually supportive relationship instantly yeah. yes and uh, because we were both trying to get uh, song publishing deals so I would go with him to the green room at Ready Steady Go which was where he would do networking I mean, Reggie Steady Go was the biggest television, you know, pop music show then in the in the very early 60s. And I, in fact, got booked for it before he did. I got booked. Um, it was called Reggie Steady Goes Live. And that's because I'd met in these in this green room. I'd met the two managers who managed Donovan and they decided to take me on uh, as well. So. I kind of, in a way, got started before he did, although he was a few years older than me. But he he was still doing, he was doing stuff. When I was signed to Decca, he was signed to an offshoot of Decca called DRAM. And we both had, for my second LP, we both had Mike Vernon produce our albums. So we, music was the big thing. Okay, there was a bit of horizontal activity that goes on in between. But I knew I never wanted to be you know, a full-time girlfriend. I'm sure he didn't want me as a full-time girlfriend. We both had to be free. You've got to be free in the music business. It, you know, marriage does not work in your teens or fidelity doesn't work either because you're out on the road. I know what musicians do when they're out on the road and they're having a good time. So I understood that from an early age. <laughs> You were also both singing a lot of folk music at that time, weren't you? I mean, he was singing some folk influence music. Donna Donna, of course, is uh, a folk song. Can you tell me about that song and how it came about? Well, Donna Donna actually was sung to me by a, a girlfriend of mine, you know, a, 
we were 12 or something and it's a, basically it's an Israeli folk song apparently about a calf being taken to market to be slaughtered. I had to find a couple of songs very quickly for my first single and Donna Donna was one I could play on the guitar and so it was my first single for Pi. I always wrote the B-sides because that way you get the same amount of royalties. It was Bowie who helped me with the second appearance at Ready Said Go. I, he said, why not try this song called Love Is Strange that was originally done by a duo, duo called Mickey and Sylvia. And he showed me the bass line. And I remember those notes even now. He, I don't think he was actually in the audience. I mean, we never went to each other's shows. We met when we were doing other things. And then shortly after that, he met the girlfriend. That he had, had quite a big love affair with a girlfriend called Hermione Farthingale. But I knew all about her. It didn't get in the way of him and me and our relationship um, because ours had nothing to do with, you could say, love, in, if I'm going to go like that. Ours was, ours was a different kind of relationship. I mean, Hermione yeah. was obviously the one with the mousy hair from yes. Life on Mars, wasn't she? Yeah. Um, and I bleach blonde, bleach blonded mine, so it definitely wasn't me. But he did when he he used to. I lived in South Kensington, and they were staying in a flat around the corner in South Kensington. And at one time, he did call me up and he said, "Listen, I'm just around the corner. I've just written a song half an hour ago. I really think this you should hear it." And I had a a boyfriend then called Gerard Mankovich, who's quite a famous rock photographer. And Gerard and I were there and he, David came over and played us Space Oddity. I don't think we realised how iconic it would be, but this was just when, you know, the, the, the Kubrick film came out 2000 and, you know, was it 2001? And Bowie and I used to watch all these early Ken Russell films, these black and white films on television. I mean, tele black and white was mostly the thing in the very early days. And we always used to watch a thing with uh, with starring Anthony Newley called The Strange World of Gurney Slade. And anyone that knows Bowie's early work will know how influenced he was from Anthony Newley. The voice, the mannerisms, the way he held his hat, the voice especially, which he didn't really own up to till about a couple of albums later. And then he did say this is where he got this kind of slightly Cockney accent from, because he wasn't really like that when you spoke to him. But the same can be said of Mick Jagger as well. I think they all put on their Cockney accents at a time when it seemed suitable. Um, but it you, was it was the songs that were important. You met his parents, which was a really fascinating meeting because you coming from a completely different liberal type of atmosphere at home and his, well, you describe it as very cold. Well, the atmosphere was cold. Yes. And I mean, I come from what you might, I think you remember, might remember in the book when I asked my mother, what are we? And she said, we're aristocrats. So I came from upper class, expensive, private how uh, school holidays every school holiday we went somewhere Mallorca no not Mallorca what am I saying Marbella when it was still being built I mean we were or close to skiing I mean I knew holidays three times a year whereas I'd never been it sounds awful to say this now but I'd never been into a working class house before I didn't know what a working class house looked like. I never met anyone like that. So it was a tiny little house. By the way, I live in a tiny house now, probably the same size, because I love small. I can't think of anything worse than being in a huge house and running around, but I love small. But then it was, it was cold because his parents didn't really speak. They obviously didn't know what to say to me and what on earth was David doing with this young girl, although he was young. And at the same time, um, Terry, the half brother of David, was in the was in the mental home, and then I think he commit, committed suicide. And, you know, there's all sort of dark things, and I can make conversation. I can get blood from a stone, but in this case, I found it very difficult to talk to them. And the moment they had gone out, probably to see Terry in the in the home, David said to me, "Whatever it takes, I am going to get out of here." So he wanted out. So that's the difference between him and me. We hang around a lot together. He wanted out and I was quite comfortable at home. I didn't want out. You know, I lived at home till I was 30. It was fabulous. I had a flat, a huge flat at the bottom of my parents' house and I could make music 
all day, all night long. People, every musician in London used to drop by, by the, the place that, that David and Angie, his then wife, called the bunker. And uh, so I was kind of comfortable, whereas he was desperate to move from where he was. He was I mean, looking back, would you say that this is where his drive came from? Because often, you know, drive comes from... Um, Deprivation. Um, well, childhood wound in a lot of ways. I think sometimes I, I it does. I would say so, yes. I, mean, I would think so too. But I think also when you're young and music gets a hold of you, you know that's what you want to do. You just don't know how you're going to do it, actually. I mean, when I look back, in, we have quite parallel lines, of, you know, doing sort of weird films, both of us, different kind of weirdness. Um, you do whatever comes your way. Uh, we don't, we never really picked and chose what what came along. You just did anything because you needed to work, you needed to learn. Um, he was passionate about learning his mime. And I suppose I was about 15 or something when he took me off to see Lindsay Kemp doing the Poirot thing. Um, I'm very bad at numbers and age, so I may be completely out with the years and the dates, but it doesn't matter. Bowie fans will know far better than I. What, But it was in a tiny, tiny little theatre called the Mercury Theatre. So I, he was doing all sorts of things. We both of us went, not together, to movement classes, dance classes. You did whatever you needed to do in order to get by. And we both of us bought the Melody Maker and the Stage, which were the two Bibles for people in this business. And you looked instantly at the back page to see if there were any adverts, auditions. And so he and I both auditioned for hair and we both got turned down, <laughs> which I think is quite funny. Tony Visconti, uh, when I interviewed him, he described Bowie as two things, as a sponge in terms of he would take so much information from other people and 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 take it into his sphere and 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 use it in a different way and secondly um in places like Haddon Hall which I think Tony Visconti was often at Bowie would use or he'd do a mime to the fridge so he'd go over do a mime to the fridge pick out the milk come back and he said he would practice certain movements and things I never saw him doing that no I never saw Visconti there I mean I the last time I saw Visconti was a few weeks ago at the T-Rex thing where I was singing with, he was there conducting the the bat bit of the, the string bit. And I was there with um, lovely Mark Armand and Holly Johnson and, and the band T-Rex to see, which was fabulous at the Shepherd's Bush Empire. Um, but then I never saw lots of things going on at Haddon Hall. I certainly didn't see him doing a mime to a, thing of milk he might have done that with Visconti but I shouldn't think he did it very often and and I know that Woody Woodman's in his then drummer from the Spiders of Mars said that there were lots of naked girls on the lawn now I never saw that either whenever I went there it was usually with Tony de Vries, who was who then David had said you know I think I found the perfect man to be our manager and Angie and he went to see de Vries first and then they they pulled me in to meet de Vries. and for about four years, five years, it was the most perfect partnership ever till the House of Cards collapsed. But that's another story. So I never saw that, never saw any naked girls, but I did see the spiders from Mars. And I spent a lot of time with Mick Ronson, Rono, because musically things were going on. And it was very obvious if I do remember, let's say there was a day when Bowie was watching the television again in black and white. And suddenly there was a great yell and we all had to rush in. He used to sort of sit on his bed with his guitar and bits of paper around him and say, look at this, it's Kabuki theatre. So we were all watching Kabuki theatre. So he was, he did, he was a sponge. He was a bit like a parasite. He, you can hear it musically. Um, good examples is something like fame. He's absolutely stolen a James Brown lick, note for note but he's made it his own. He was very good at taking what he wanted from somebody or something he heard and making it his own, which is fine. It didn't bother me. He introduced you to Angie one day, phoned you up and said, I've met this woman, you have to meet her, you're going to love her, and you did. Yeah, yeah. Can, you, can you tell me what you and Angie had in common? What was it about her that you really appreciated and liked? Well... I loved the way that she so 
looked after David. You know, he never gave her, in my opinion, enough credit for what she did for him. She did everything for him. She was totally dedicated. And we both adored David. So we were both on the same side, if you know what I mean. I mean, she was loud and brash, being American, she can't help it because that's how a lot of them are. He was the quiet one. If you'd go to a party or a function, she was louder than everyone. And he was quite often quiet and subdued, uh, obviously taking things in and locking things up in his brain for what he was going to write. But she did everything. I mean, literally everything and helped him. Uh, was always very pro when listening to her, his songs, you know, it was always, this is great and, you know, marvellous and encouraged him, as well as all the clothes shopping. You know, she'd go out and buy eight pairs of shoes for him, for her and for me. And quite often they were all the same. But certainly she and he had the same size clothes, uh, waistband and everything, because she was built like a whippet. And then when Main Man was going from 1971 or sort of, thing um, our management company uh, the woman that made all the clothes Natasha Korniloff for and for Angie to dress David in until he then got Freddie Beretti who was this young dressmaker um, she encouraged all this these clothing she's the one that encouraged the spiders of Mars to get into glitter and sequiny stuff she could she could talk the back leg off back leg off a donkey whatever that expression is she was super powerful and super marvelous and she was my best friend we used to hang out a lot together especially i think when david maybe needed a bit of kind of quiet time just send angie off with dana they can go and have fun so that when zoe the baby was born david was the one that said to me i'll oh, take angie with you um, because he kept the baby at home. I mean, the baby is now Duncan Jones, but you know, for the first few years, as far as I was concerned, he was Zoe. And Angie and I went off to Italy with my mother and had a really nice holiday. But actually, David was ringing every day after a week, he was missing her and he called her back. So she curtailed the ho holiday and I stayed on with my mother. But we always, we were always, always great friends. And even now, I mean, of course, she lives in America and I nearly. I mean, I was at South by Southwest in March for the festival this year, but I don't really go much to America because I haven't got an agency over there. So who's going to book me? And so I tend to work mostly in Europe, but we're still friends. Facebook, or not Facebook, um, emailing friends. Hey, you mentioned Tony DeVries and that yeah. Bowie introduced you uh, to him and said that yeah. I found the perfect manager for us. Yeah. Um, what was perfect about him for you? Well, I've always said I'm right. I do have a soft spot for anybody that puts their arm around my shoulder and goes, There, there, let me take care of this. And this is exactly what he did for us, Bowie and myself. We had any musician we wanted, any rehearsal rooms, unlimited time in Trident Studios to record, which is this is what musicians want is to be able to record, to be able to have the musicians you want, to get the sounds you want. I mean, I, this was for when I was doing Weren't Born a Man. Um, Bowie had already done, I, I get very confused with the chronological order. I think it must have been Hunky Dory or Man Who Fell to Earth. I can't remember which one, but that David already done that for DeFries and I had already made two albums for Decca. So my Weren't Born a Man, suddenly I was being given the musicians I wanted. Um, I'd wanted, for example, Paul Buckmaster, Buckmaster to do the strings. He did all of our early Elton stuff. and um, uh, But I couldn't get him because he was so busy. So I got this marvellous guy, Del Newman, and suddenly I've got a string orchestra in Trident Studios, which I had actually in Decca Studios. So for me, it was this thing of, you know, here's musicians. They'll get paid for rehearsals. I mean, that's a first as well. Um, you know, and DeFries had always said that in life, if you want to make it, you should really give off the apparent vibe that you're doing very well, successful. Um, so he made sure that when D Bowie went to America, and I think he landed, he was there for about th two or three months, and did about 10 gigs, and not in very big places either, but they all stayed in five-star hotels. Every time I went to America, 
We had 24-7 limos. We flew first class or business class everywhere. The Fries made sure that we were treated like stars before we were. And D David was always in a way one step ahead of me because A, he was a few years older. B, I think his songs were more ready than mine were. And C, I was, I was doing Jesus Christ Superstar for the first year. So I couldn't actually travel anywhere and I could only go to Haddon Hall on Sunday and get back by Monday afternoon in order to do eight shows a week. So I've all, you know, my 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 work has always come first before party time. I've never been anyone that's got so untogether they can't get on stage. He gave you um, the track Andy Warhol from the Hunky Dory, which was later he recorded. Um, yeah. But he gave you that to record, but his came out before yours. Well, um, yes, but mine was recorded first. That um, I because I couldn't finish the whole album in time because I was stuck in Jesus Christ Superstar. I think he he gave me the song. I mean, I never really questioned it. He always said he wrote it for me. Now, that might have been an exaggeration, but he said this live on the John Peel show that he's written it for me and given it to me. However, he did take it to try and play it to Andy Warhol himself, who wasn't that interested, apparently walked out of the room and came back in. I wasn't there when this happened. Apparently, Andy Warhol was more interested in David's uh, patent leather shoes or they were yellow or something. I can't remember. But he 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 was very kind to give it to me because when he's given songs away, OK, there's all the young dudes, not the hoople. When he tried to get Freddie Beretti, who couldn't unfortunately sing, and it came out as Arnold Corns, he he liked to have other people recording his material, which is a big buzz if you're a songwriter. But he didn't rate Andy Warhol that much for himself until he played guitar and sang the backing vocals on my version. Although most people think it was Bowie and Rono who produced The Weren't Born a Man, actually it was I produced it with Robin Cable. And this particular track, David and Rono were there, but I've always liked to produce myself, but with help from great engineers. Um, but in a way they did, maybe Rock, well, certainly Rono much more than David, they did sort of produce it just by being there, but they weren't at the mix or anything, which which is what I always think is important. So if you listen carefully to my version, you can hear David's voice in the background and you can hear him playing the 12 string guitar, which we both played because we were neither of us that great guitarists. If you play a 12 string and you're strumming away, you know, like that, being a folky performer, um, then I'm just adjusting this. I realize it went like that and you have no idea. I was trying to show that simulating I was playing the guitar. If you play a 12 string, it makes double the amount of noise for because there's double the amount of strings. So we both were 12 string players, actually. Um, so he, yeah, then he liked his version so much and his album was ready to go. So he put it on, you know, his album and, and then mine came out later but I did the first version. Tell me about Ziggy Stardust, because you are on one of the one of the tracks singing as backing well, singer. I, I am on the It Ain't Easy song. Um, well, I because Bowie had already done that song with me as the backing singer for uh, the John Peel show. And he it's the one of the songs that he didn't write. Uh, I think it was written by a guy called Ron Davis. Um, so, yeah, I, I can't say that I remember the sessions that well because I, I'd done so many sessions in my life. Don't forget, you didn't mention all those ones I did with Elton John in the 60s, which were all those cover, those weird cover version things. So I, my whole life has been spent in studios. So I can't actually tell you exactly what it was like being in the studios, but I guess I was came in after the basic tracks were done and put the backing vocals on with, I think, Jeff McCormack. Who, who used to go out as his stage name was Warren Peace, which was quite funny. And But he stayed friendly with, with David all the time because he, he was in the Diamond Dogs show. And I'm one of the few people that has been lucky enough to have seen the Diamond Dogs show because, of course, by this time I was, what was I? I think I was in the National Theatre or something, but I was able to fly over to uh, Los Angeles every 
few days and then go back and do some Shakespeare. I mean, my life was ridiculous in those days, but seeing Diamond Dogs has to have been probably the most amazing stage show I have ever seen because it didn't last for long in that form. It was so expensive to put on and it was just incredible that I feel honoured to have seen it actually. Um, and it couldn't go on the road very much because the the actual set was outrageously expensive. But again, whatever David wanted, De Vries said yes to. He always facilitated David for whatever his musical needs were. And so for that, I applaud De Vries. How exciting was this period for you, creating your own um, album, you know, writing your own tracks, getting yourself out there and you know even being able okay, okay in retrospect of course it's a big thing and back then for you this was a mate giving you a song so but in retrospect this was you know one of the greatest icons in the history of music giving you a which song of course he, he which he wasn't then he was he was just you know all through the years I've always thought of him just as just as my mate you know as, as I think of Jimmy Page or any of them actually because in the 60s, of course, the music scene was so small that one knew everyone. Um, yeah, it they were great times, but I just got on with it like work, you know. I mean, I was sad when Main Man collapsed, as I knew it probably would eventually. I did two albums for them. Why did you know it would collapse? Well, I've, I've learned that nothing lasts forever. I mean, nothing does. It, 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 it couldn't... Well, I could see probably I could see the writing on the wall between David and De Vries. De Vries is 80 now and he lives in South Africa. And I I saw what amazing things he did. And neither David or I questioned the finances. We both signed the same contracts, 50 percent to Mayman, 50 percent to us. But the 50 percent to us would only come in there when we covered our costs and our advances were quite high both of us had great advances but the costs were phenomenal the secretary birds we all moved to america we all lived in great hotels i was with david nanji and little zoe in the sherry netherlands hotel for what felt like weeks i can't really remember how long it was because it was it was kind of high old times and we had a ball but everything was paid for by by De Vries and Main Man. So I knew that something had to probably crack. I wanted it to go on forever, but in a way the rot started to set in when David didn't want to come back to England and De Vries started to close the English office down because there was not much to do here. So I I just knew it was going to end. But I had a such an amazing time that I will never, ever, ever regret uh, my time with De Vries and I acknowledge what he did greatly and I'm sad that David never did David wouldn't have him or Angie ever mentioned you know in, even my pal Francis Wakeley who did the three BBC documentaries on Bowie he told me that he couldn't actually mention he was not allowed by the Bowie estate to mention Angie or, 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 or De Vries otherwise he would never have got footage to use his document in his documentaries but that's how David seemed to function. I think he liked, he took the best of things and when he got what he needed, he moved somewhere else. But in a sense, your friendship definitely suffered because of your connection to Angie, because I presume that in a sense that he drifted apart from you because of, of your connection to her. Actually, it was not so much Angie. I think it's the fact that he decided to live in America. He decided to do, start this ridiculous legal battle. And I mean, I got caught in the middle too with the main man thing. So he stayed in America and he had lots of money to get the best lawyers. Um, Angie and their divorce thing was sad. She didn't have any money. He didn't give her much. He gave her peanuts to survive on, even though she had his son. So she had to cope and she lived somewhere else in America. But I've never really gone to America much. So geographically, we had an ocean between us. I think it probably didn't help because I've never made enemies with anyone in my life. When I look back, even people who've maybe been bad to me, my view on it is 
it's much better that they shit on me than if I would have shat on them. Because I think, well, I can take bad times, but some people can't. So, and I have love and forgiveness in my soul and some people don't. So that's, a, it's, a, it's a different mentality. So he was quite brutal in the way he cut off everyone, not just me, Ronson. He didn't speak to Rono for ages, years and years. And then finally, when Rono was diagnosed with cancer, um, and by this time I saw Rono in London and he was really broken up that, you know, David didn't speak to him and everything. And, you know, he and, and he was by this time, as I said, diagnosed and it was terminal cancer. Then David did ask him to play at the Freddie Mercury AIDS awareness concert at, at Wembley. Um, so they did get together, but by this time it was too late. Rono was on his way out. But I always understood also why David did what he did, which was not work with the Spiders of Mars. I think he used to blame it on De Vries, but if he wanted something done, he would say De Vries said, said it. So he was able to pass the buck. He just wanted new blood, a new country, and if you're living in America, it makes sense to have American musicians. De Vries let me have my own British musicians for nearly two years living in America where I had this amazing drummer called Simon Phillips, who's one of the most famous in the world. He was only 16 when I met him, but and he was seven, 16, 17 when we were touring America. But it's um, you can't really have British musicians when you're living in America. You might as well just get American musicians. It just made life easier financially and everything. And by this time, David, who had all taken to America like a duck to water, he, he just wanted to be in New York. And I had to go back because suddenly the main man was collapsing. So there was nowhere for me to stay anymore. I, it, uh, the flat that I had been in, which had had Iggy Pop in it um, before me, uh, it ha everything had to go back and suddenly the company went, well, I suppose bust in a way. I don't even really know what happened to it, but everything collapsed and I came back to England. You came back to England and that had collapsed. What? What was your, there, there was a period, or it seems to be a period in your life, which was quite difficult then, or was it? Well, I was still doing, yeah, I was still recording and writing, but I couldn't, I didn't know how to get anything out because until the main man legal thing had been tied up, I couldn't technically record for anyone. So I was at the National Theatre doing Shakespeare. I did um, various films people seem to remember all the hammer films where basically you need loads of cleavage falling in and out of chamois leather outfits and chasing dinosaurs up and down hills I did whatever I could do I did films the odd tv thing um a lot of songwriting I was recording but I couldn't get anything out until this thing got sorted and the freeze uh, De Vries then moved from Switzerland, where he was dealing in gold. He then moved to South Africa. So then I never saw him for years as well. But we had to all settle up this this legal thing, and it took me about four years, four years of my years of my years of my life. But you know, I had really kind people around me, like Mark Boland gave me this funny minivan because De Vries, the, 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 the car was repossessed. You know, Mark was sweet. I've always had really, really good friends. The music business of the people in the old days, everyone was friendly and everyone was nice. And they all lived in basically in the London area. It was very hard to make a name for yourself in the music business if you weren't in London. I mean, there were exceptions like Brian Epstein in, in, in Liverpool, but in the end, everyone came to London. So it wasn't that easy, but I guess had I not had these tough times, I wouldn't have gone to Vienna, which became sort of like my saviour. I, I always say that I flew to Vienna like a bird with a broken wing. I mean, I somehow was arrived. I did a, I went and did a theatre piece uh, for a pretty amazing um, theatre director called Mai Zetterling. She's now dead as well, but it was strangely enough a William Saroyan play. And I then met up with a great blues band over there called the Mojo Blues Band and I sang with them. And then I was free to record. So I came back to England in between, commuting between London and Vienna and found the lovely Ace Records where I said to them, I want to do an album 
finally I want to do blues because I knew that's something I was good at. And I said, I want to do an album with all the rudest blues songs I can find. And I want to call the album Blue Job. And they so fell about laughing, or the boss did, Ted Carroll, that um, that I signed the next five, six albums with them. Tell me about the songs um, on well, that first album then. Well, I did songs like Organ Grinder, It's Not Your Organ, But The Way You Grind, Joe's Joint, which is about a place, not a joint, but it's double meaning. It's Fat Sam from Birmingham, Big Ten Inch, which is about a 10 inch record, but again, double meaning. Um, I, I just knew that this would be a kind of music that I could do till I got years older. Blue singers go on till they literally drop down dead on stage, preferably, or at least as far as the dressing room. Whereas doing the kind of poppy stuff, the, you know, with the stiletto heels and the plunging neckline, I could feel my days were going to be numbered. I could sense the sell by date. And I'd always wanted to do blues as my second album, it was my fourth album, but my second album for May Man was called Ain't Gonna Play No Second Fiddle, which is an old blues song. Everyone thought I'd wrote that because, or that I'd sung it because of the con thing of being second in line behind Bowie in the main man stable, but it wasn't the case actually. I just liked the song. Um, so I was already headed down blue, the blues highway. And even during Superstar, when the show was over every night, I used to leap into my car and go and sing with a, a blues band or a rock and roll band in a pub down the road. Well, wherever I could sing. So Blue Job, I just wanted them to be all the kind of slightly naughty songs. If I had been 20 years older or 30 years older, I could have been like Sophie Tucker, who was famous for coming on stage and singing all the rude songs. But I thought it was something that was kind of funny. It amused me. It still amuses me. And it amuses me every time I can get a song that's... I just did one about four years ago on a, an album with an Austrian band, and I call the song the FCK Blues. FCK, the only thing that's missing is you. I mean, I like things that have got a touch of a slightly tongue-in-cheek sense of humour to them. Have you ever covered Sissy Man Blues? I haven't actually, no. So it's I the should. first gay mention song. I mean, you probably know it, I would think. But it's, yes, uh, you I know, do. If you... um, uh, the last blues I did, but it's not really a blues, is lovely Mark Armand wrote. It's called Brewer Street Blues. I think if anyone's going to do a, a gay, as in from a male point of view, album, I think probably they should be gay and do it themselves. And Because I would be... I'm not probably gay enough. I mean, I am now officially a fag hag, of course, because most of my <laughs> friends, male friends are gay. Because when you get to my age, gay guys love the slightly outrageous woman. And I always say every woman should have at least two or three gay friends in their life. You know, my best friends are gay guys. They come over and you can have a chin wag and I go on holiday and um, which is great. Tell <laughs> me about your work with Mark Armand. Oh, Mark, um, I love Mark. He's great. Um, he he decided to produce, as in pay for, my latest album, which we finished recording about two months ago. And it's the first time I've ever done an album of covers. So he, I get to sing a duet with him, um, which was the Leonard Cohen song, Dance Me to the End of Love. But they they chose, he and the, his musical partner, Tris Penner, chose maybe 65 percent of the songs i chose the rest and one is a bowie song one is um can you hear me um i even get to sing a lana del rey song which is i could have said is out of my comfort zone but it, it didn't feel out of my comfort zone it's very different i get to sing a fabulous song that mark himself wrote and mark has turned into a really really good friend and so quite often when he's in london we go out for what I could call a non-PC lunch where you can hoot with laughter about all subjects that you can't say in public to anybody. So him, me and Tris Penner usually sit on a table at the far end of a decent restaurant where we can just get away with murder and hope nobody's out listening. But he's he was great. He was very kind and asked me to do the, the T-Rex, the Mark Boland show. And so we sang... Mark Boland's song, Light of Love. 
But I saw I saw Mark Armand when he was on tour a few months ago in Vienna, and I saw him with his band then. And you know, he's he's very charismatic, you know, and uh, he, he's done such great things. I lo always loved his Jacques Brel stuff, and um, he's was very big in Russia, believe it or not. And I'm the only other person I know who's ever been to Russia to sing as many times as he has. So we also have quite parallel lives. But he and Holly Johnson both said. I mean, Holly of, of Frankie Goes to Hollywood, both said the moment they saw David Bowie sort of going down on his knees in front of Rono's guitar, sort of, you know, not quite giving it a blowjob, but, you know, imitating it, they both thought, they both said, my God, this is amazing. And when David put his arm round Rono on television, never before seen, you know, all these people that were ready to come out of the closet Open those doors and out they came. And it was such fun. You know, David had fun. It's funny how you mentioned Starman and on top of the pops, because that was actually the one that got me as well. So there you go. Uh, well, I'm doing a Bowie thing. You know, they do these huge conventions. Last This year it was in New York. I'm doing one in Liverpool next July. So Visconti's going. Um, Mark Wardell will be there, who also yes. did a Well, picture. Mark Wardell, did you see the cover he did of my album? Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Marvellous. It's a great picture. And how did you see it? Did I, have you seen it online or something? No, I've interviewed did... him and he sent oh, me the picture. I think. It was actually Tris Penner who suggested to me, use Mark. Um, because I'd come to the point where the, the next album had to look radically different because it's recorded live at this place called the Temple of Art and Music. And I I wanted it to, I mean, he first of all, he did one cover that made me look almost like David Bowie. I said, no, you can't, that's too much. So he did a slightly more Gillespie version of, of me and everyone loved the cover. In fact, I keep thinking I should have badges and t-shirts made up because it's actually very striking but uh, have you in you've interviewed Mark Waddell then have you yeah I've interviewed him a couple of times because of Cracked Actor because you mentioned Diamond Dogs of course and Cracked Actor was the documentary around that time and uh he's you know I would say in a very positive way his obsession uh with with Bowie in in his say it's more career. than an obsession it's with certainly with a capital O um and I'm pleased that there are people that have these obsessions because these people are going to carry on Bowie's legacy. And I suspect, I mean, I may be wrong, but I think Bowie will be remembered more iconically, et cetera, than even, let's say, the Rolling Stones, because when they're not around, that, that will be it. But there will be people out there who will adore Bowie for the look, the, the whole vibe change of every gay man that I've ever met. He... He was a game changer and uh, he will he will be remembered, you know, hundreds of years from now, I'm sure, just from how he looked. Although I always preferred him before he had his teeth done. I want to get hard. to your philosophy because you mentioned about uh, the essence of forgiveness. I forgot your exact words, but you, you mentioned that you don't really hold grudges. You forgive and you yeah. forget and so on and so forth. Um, but your philosophy is also, there's a story that it's connected in a way to Bob Dylan um, and the Indian philosophy that you followed. Well, the, uh, well, the Bob Dylan thing came up, of course, of course, he was a boyfriend in 1965. I met him, I think it was about two weeks after my 16th birthday. But I always say, had I been two weeks before and in theoretically underage, I wouldn't have cared. And I doubt that he would have either. Um, so we... There was times when I didn't see him that often because of obviously being in America. But um, he before two days before the tour started, when he'd asked me to be the opening act for his British tour. And this must have been, I think, 1997. He called me up and he said, I'm coming around to see you. He said this was quite late at night. He didn't ask me, was I married? Did I have children or anything? He just said, I'll be there in half an hour. And he's bouncer. He's you know, looking after person, dropped him at my front door and we talked for four hours. And while he was in my house, in the old days, I might have rolled him a joint or something. These, then, 97, um, he had a fennel tea and we both of us talked 
well, I never have alcohol in the house because I don't, I never like the taste of it. So I don't ever offer it to people. But we talked for four hours and um, uh, he, he went up to my, I have a top floor in my house, which is loosely what I call my meditation room. I've just got to press some, something, to, uh, strange thing, buttons come up on the screen. It's gone. Um he saw a book called, uh, called Quotations of World Religions, and everyone knows he's always been quite religious himself. I mean, Bowie went through a B Buddhist phase and a this and that phase, and, and, and Dylan also went through, well, obviously being born Jewish, but he went to various other religions. He's always had an interest, and his best friend in the Beatles was George Harrison. So he took this book and he said, can I have this? And I gave it to him, and when he left, that's when I thought, I it, the book was of quotations and I'd been collecting quotations for 20 years. My father had always, always kept quotations himself. You find a pithy sentence and you write it in an exercise book and you go back and you ponder it. So then I, that's where I had the thought to put my first book together called Mirrors of Love, which I did with my then boyfriend, who was quite a famous Viennese artist called Jörg Huber, sadly died just before COVID. But actually, I'm quite pleased he got out because he'd have hated being shut in. He'd have said, fuck you, and would have probably been arrested for going out at the wrong time. Anyway, so Dylan took the book and I was, he, Dylan, I mean, was the inspiration for the book. And I sent him a copy when I finally got it printed. And that's also because I my life totally changed when I went to see Sai Baba, the Indian guru, the first time. And George Harrison had been, uh, Pete Townsend had been, but he's, his guru was Mir, Mir Baba. And obviously for George Harrison, his guru was Krishna because he went with Ravi Shankar. But nearly everyone who's any interest in this kind of music used to go and see Sai Baba, but he's physically not been on this planet for about, forget, five, six years or something. I was the only Western artist that sang every year for him, which he asked for me especially, which was a massive honor. And so um, I've always had, I've always had, I think, leanings for, you know, Sai Baba's uh, saying is love all, serve all. And I feel this is a pretty good way to function. Even your worst enemy, try and love them. They're, everyone can find something good in somebody. And my favorite, one of my favorite stories from Sai Baba was he used to say the story about uh, the holy man walking along the road with his 12 disciples and they, they see a dead dog by the side of the road and the, all the disciples go and say, Ooh, it stinks, how horrible, and they cross over the road. But this holy guy goes, yes, but look at his beautiful teeth. So the dead dog had beautiful teeth. It's up to us to see something marvelous that we should all look for the best thing in somebody else. So although people might complain maybe about how Bowie treated the spiders from Mars or Rono or whatever, or even Angie, or even to freeze, each you look at the good things and Bowie had to do what he had to do in order to get to the next level up. And so I've always looked for nice things in people. And a lot of people have said when they finish reading my memoirs, I haven't said anything nasty about anybody because I can't. There's nothing nasty to say. There's a lot of humour because you've got to laugh at things, but definitely not nastiness. Do you think that's the secret to why you're still so busy today and younger artists um, still want to work with you and people are still enamoured by you and people still want to hear you, that actually you have led this life where you've been with people along the way and never against them. Yes, I mean, I'm very lucky because I tend to work with really good musicians, although some of them are really young. Um, I've all through my life, my the bands I've had around me have been fantastic because it's like I said, when you have music as your main goal, that changes everything. And this... Next year, it will. I'll be 60 years in the music business and we're going to try and launch a thing called Around the World in 60 Songs. And so I shall find different places where I've written songs. De Vries told me and Bowie that we should always write where our 
songs were written. So it, we, it's true, I used to write songs in Mustique when I ran the blues festival for 20 years. I'd always put the place where I wrote it. So I I will go around the world in 60 songs. And I guess that's, you know, I, 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 I tend to bump into people who love music. They're less bothered by fame and celebrity. And personally, if I was 20 now, I dread to think what would have happened to me. I would probably be singing in nothing but a bit of dental floss and I would be, you know, falling out of cars and, you know, hotels at five in the morning and everything's filmed virally. It, it's really not easy for when you're young. And also if you do a concert now when you're young and you're not very good at it because you're starting, even though you've had a hit record, you might be out of tune because let's face it, a lot of the singers get to use auto-tune when I was young I had the chance to improve and learn without the world and his wife seeing me making mistakes even though I knew I made them you know I had to learn the hard way you know I had funny times being on the road when I was very young but no worse than Bowie or anyone else but nowadays it's doubly hard because young people are so pressurized into they must be a big, they've got to be a star, they've got to be a celebrity, they've got to have huge lips and massive makeup and tits up to here. Well, thank God I didn't have to worry about that because I don't really believe in surgical enhancement. And I do believe in wrinkles and I do believe in growing old gracefully. But I also believe in if you want to get to my age, swim, exercise every day, think nice thoughts, smile at people, be nice to everyone, never, ever give anyone shit in hard times because you don't know what hard times they might be going through. So that's always been my philosophy. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. And I'm just going to end by Sai Baba saying, love all, serve all, help ever, hurt never. Up there is an interview I recommend. Down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews. And here is where you can connect. Thank <laughs> you.